Because we hate you and want you to suffer, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be seen tonight. Instead, we present the following piece of shit. Happy holidays, everybody, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Well, it seems once again the world has been gripped by Star Wars fever with the release of Episode 7, The Force Awakens. And I am right there with them. I love Star Wars. Ever since I saw the original trilogy years ago, I was hooked. It's a classic tale of the struggle between the forces of good and evil, with a little bit of science fiction and mysticism thrown in, and special effects that were way ahead of their time. It was amazing. But it hasn't always been wine and roses for this franchise. The original trilogy was followed by the prequel trilogy in the late 1990s, and to this day, these movies still leave a sour taste in the fans' mouths. While I personally don't think these movies are quite as bad as some people make them out to be... Whoa, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. I did not say they were great. They're not. I just think they get a little more hate than they really deserve. Fucking fanboys! Well, whether they deserve the hate or not, the prequels do have their share of problems. They suffer from mediocre stories, weak characters, awful dialogue, Jar Jar, subpar acting, over-reliance on digitally created environments, and Jar Jar. That's not to say the original movies were perfect, but they brought something special to the table that the prequels lacked. And this taught everyone a valuable lesson. Even in a franchise as beloved as Star Wars, not everything that comes out of it will be gold. But of course, anyone who was watching CBS on the evening of November 17th, 1978 already knew this because they were the unfortunate bastards who bore witness to the subject of today's review. The Star Wars Holiday Special. Yes, I suppose it was only a matter of time before I got around to reviewing this. The Star Wars Holiday Special is one of the most legendarily bad moments not just in Star Wars history, but in the history of television itself. It is two long hours of utter nonsense that will make anyone wonder, why was this put on the air? Supposedly, this special was born out of concern from George Lucas that people would lose interest in Star Wars before the sequel, The Empire Strikes Back, would be ready for release in 1980. Now, obviously, these fears proved to be unfounded, but keep in mind, this was back when Star Wars was brand new. Nobody expected it to be as huge as it was, and even with the ridiculous amount of money it made at the box office, no one knew what kind of staying power it would actually have. Plus, most people did not have the luxury of simply watching the movie at home since the home video market was still in its infancy and VCRs were expensive as shit. So Lucas wanted something to tide people over and keep Star Wars fresh in their minds until Empire was ready to go. 
To this day, no one is entirely sure who came up with the idea, or at least no one is willing to accept the blame for it, but somehow Lucas got together with CBS and they began creating what would become the Star Wars Holiday Special. The production was... troubled, to say the least. Several writers and directors came and went, and Lucas himself had very little direct involvement as he was busy with several other projects at the time. The end result is less space fantasy and more space travesty. Even Lucas himself was unhappy with how it turned out, and considering this is the same George Lucas who gave us this asshole, that is saying something. The show has never been rebroadcast on TV since its original airing in 1978, nor has it ever been released on home video, but it survives to this day thanks to home recordings. So please keep that in mind whenever I show clips from the special in this review. When you're working with decades-old bootleg VHS, you're not going to get 1080p. The special starts off with Han Solo and Chewbacca in the Millennium Falcon being chased by stock footage. Chewie is desperately trying to get home to his family so they can celebrate something called Life Day, which is apparently the Wookiee equivalent of Christmas or Kwanzaa or whatever. And of course, they have to call it the Star Wars Holiday Special because you don't want to piss off the PC police. Will this war on Life Day never cease? After they jump to light speed, we head to the Wookiee's home world of Kashyyyk, where we meet Chewbacca's family, his wife Mala, son Lumpy, and father Itchy. And yes, that's actually what they're called. At least Mala sounds normal-ish, but Itchy and Lumpy? They sound like rejected names for the seven dwarves. Now I suppose I should point out, because if I don't, at least 50 people will in the comments, that those are in fact nicknames, much like how Chewie is a nickname for Chewbacca. Their real names are Malatobuk, Adichitkuk, and Lumpawarump. But nobody watching the special at the time would have known that. Imagine hearing about a Star Wars TV special and getting really excited about it, and then when you finally tune in, you discover two of the main characters are named Itchy and Lumpy. How long would it take for you to change the channel? Well, if the names don't convince you to switch over to ABC, this certainly will. Yep, this is it, folks. This is what goes on for the next five minutes. The sounds of someone torturing a family of grizzly bears. And no, there are no subtitles. Just noise. That horrible, horrible noise. And while Lucas can rightly pass the buck on several aspects of the holiday special due to his limited involvement, he has no one to blame for this madness but himself. Focusing the story on a family of Wookiees was entirely his idea. As you might expect, at least one member of the writing staff, Bruce Valanche, had a bad feeling about this and suggested Lucas probably shouldn't build a story around non-speaking characters. The only sound they make is like fat people having an orgasm. In fact, I told Lucas he could just leave a tape recorder in my bedroom and I'd be happy to do all the looping and foley work for him. But Lucas was undeterred. He had a vision, damn it, and he was going to find a way to make it work no matter what. Or rather, he was going to leave it up to Valanche and the writers to make it work because he had no time for it. And, well, they tried. Bless their hearts, they tried. A few minutes in, I guess even the characters realized how boring they were, so they decide to entertain themselves and attempt to entertain the audience with a hologram of some rather strange-looking circus performers. This is one of... What in the fuck is going on there? This is one of the many variety acts that were added to the show to compensate for the rather anemic story. You know, I've never watched Star Wars on acid before, but I imagine if I did it would probably still look less bizarre than this. After that performance by Cirque du Soleil, we return to the Wookiee family who are growing concerned by Chewbacca's delayed arrival. At least I think that's what's going on. It's a little hard to tell when I can't understand what the hell they're saying. In any case, Mala decides to call for help and about 12 minutes into the special, not counting commercial breaks, we finally get to hear from someone who speaks English. Ladies and gentlemen, Luke Skywalker! Sweet baby Ray's barbecue sauce, what am I looking at? Better keep that lightsaber holstered, Luke. If you turn it on, it'll melt your face right off. 
I'm not entirely sure why they applied so much makeup to Mark Hamill's face. A popular fan theory is that the makeup was used to hide the scars he acquired in a car accident the year before. But while he did sustain some facial injuries in the crash, Hamill himself claimed reports of the severity of these injuries were way overblown. And between the accident and the holiday special, he made the movie Corvette Summer and presented an award at the 1978 Oscars. And he looked fine! So why did the makeup department at CBS feel the need to turn him into a living to sewed statue? Not only is it unnecessary, but it's going to give the viewers nightmares. At least Hamill actually got to appear in the special. CBS apparently didn't want to pay Kenny Baker's salary because they're using the remote controlled version of R2-D2. Then again, considering how the special turned out, maybe Baker got off lucky. The conversation between Luke and the Wookiees goes nowhere, mainly because... <laughs> Why am I watching this? And Luke signs off so he and R2 can take a hit from the producer's bong. Then we cut to a trading post run by a man named Son Dan, played by Art Carney, who is currently peddling his junk to an Imperial trooper. Four years prior, Batman won an Oscar. How the mighty have fallen. Mala contacts him asking about Chewbacca, and Son not so discreetly reassures her that he's on his way home. Don't ask me how he knows this, just go with it. I know just why you're calling. You're wondering when that shaggy carpet you ordered will arrive at your home. Shaggy carpet? <sighs> Racist. You know, it was made especially for you by a little old woman four planets away. She did it all by herself. In fact, you might say she did it by hand. Solo. Or you might say something a bit more subtle since there's an Imperial standing right next to you! Meanwhile, in a deleted scene from Episode 4, Darth Vader orders a search of every household in the Kashyyyk system to find those pesky rebels. But that sounds potentially interesting, so we go right back to the Wookiee household, where Mala is watching a cooking video hosted by Harvey Corman in drag. And he might also be wearing blackface, I'm not quite sure. Harvey Corman is a comedy legend. And for those of you who have never seen his work before, you're gonna have to take my word for it, because the Star Wars Holiday Special is a complete waste of his talents. Better yet, don't take my word for it and go watch Blazing Saddles. While we're stirring, we also whip. Mm -hmm. So it's stir, whip, stir, whip, 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 stir. Stir, whip, stir, whip, 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 stir. Stir, whip, stir, whip, 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 stir. Come on, faster all together now, cooking can be fun. Stir, whip, stir, whip, 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 stir. This is bad comedy. After some more stock footage to remind us of a much better movie we could be watching right now, we return to Kashyyyk where the Imperials have apparently set up a blockade around the planet. Due to suspected rebel activity on the Kazook planet. Wait, the what planet? The Kazook planet. Kazook? I thought it was Kashyyyk. How the hell do you get Kazook out of K-A-S-H-Y-Y-Y-K? Then again, how do you get anything out of that? Too many Ys. Son Dan then shows up, so the audience has something to listen to other than gorilla mating calls. Why all the long hairy faces? I don't know. Why all the terrible jokes? He comes bearing Life Day gifts for the family, including something called a Mind Evaporator for Itchy, which plays him a video where Diane Carroll sings a song and says some very suggestive things. And Itchy seems to be enjoying this a little too much. Oh, oh, we are excited, aren't we? Ew, ew, that's disgusting! Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, come on, it's not that bad. It's just your dirty mind reading too much into this. And you'd be wrong. It's the producers who have the dirty minds. One of them described this scene as, and I quote, softcore porno that would pass the censors. Just let that sink in. Millions of people, adults, children, families, Tuning in to CBS to watch an elderly Wookiee enjoying his own personal jerk-off video. Merry Christmas! After that giant pile of ugh, it's time for another obligatory cameo, this time featuring C-3PO and Princess Leia, played respectively by Anthony Daniels and a visibly coked out of her mind Carrie Fisher. And I am not about to blame her. When you're trapped in the Star Wars holiday special, you do what you gotta do to survive. This is yet another scene that accomplishes nothing except reminding us that no, Han and Chewie haven't arrived yet. 
Why is a ship that can move at light speed taking so goddamn long to go anywhere? Oh shit, it's the fuzz! The Imperials are going door to door in search of those rebel scum, and they're a bit suspicious of Chewbacca's absence. But Sawn attempts to distract them by being not funny. The picture you're looking at right now was taken quite a few years ago. That's uh, one of me. I've gained quite a bit of weight since then. <laughs> was that reaction in the script, or did Carney just realize his career was in the toilets? When being not funny doesn't work, his next move is to distract them with a Jefferson Starship music video. No, I'm not kidding. I'm not sure what this has to do with Star Wars, apart from the band having Starship in their name, but... Unlike the rest of the acts on the show so far, this is actually pretty decent. I'm not a big Jefferson Starship fan, but at this point I will take what I can get. By now, even the Imperials are sick of Carney's shit, and they politely but firmly ask him to get the fuck out. While they continue to search the house, Lumpy decides to entertain himself by... watching a Star Wars cartoon? So the Star Wars universe has Star Wars cartoons. You know what? Sure. I don't even care anymore. As long as we don't have to see any more of itchy spank material, I'll roll with it. The general consensus among fans is this cartoon is the best part of the holiday special. And I can understand that. Unlike everything else we've seen so far, this actually feels like it was made by people who gave a shit. But personally, I'm not a huge fan of the animation style. I think it's mostly the faces, they just look a little off. Han rarely opens his eyes, Chewie seems to be suffering from Youngblood's disease, and why does C-3PO blink? He's a robot. Who ever heard of a robot that blinks? My name is Optimus Prime. That doesn't count. The cartoon is notable for the first appearance of the bounty hunter Boba Fett. Luke runs into him while he's trying to rescue Han Solo and Chewie, who crash landed on this planet that is populated by dinosaurs for some reason. Either they've somehow traveled to prehistoric Earth, or they've wandered into the Dragon Ball universe. In either case, Boba says he has no love for the Empire and agrees to help Luke track down his friends. And with his help, they find the Millennium Falcon. But what's this? Could it be that the guy who is obviously evil may have an ulterior motive for tracking down our heroes? I have made contact with the Rebels, and all is proceeding as you wish, Darth Vader. What? Fortunately, the Rebels discover his treachery, and Boba pisses off until the Empire Strikes Back. That was a very weird cartoon, but it was entertaining for what it was. So let's get back to the bullshit. The Imperials proceed to tear the place apart, even going so far as to rip the head off of Lumpy's stuffed Bantha. Not sure what he expected to find in there. Once they're done ransacking his room, Lumpy decides now is as good a time as any to put together his Life Day present. Which is... a Commodore 64 knockoff? Well, whatever it is, it comes with an instructional video featuring Harvey Corman. Again. Man, he must have been really desperate for work when the Carol Burnett show went off the air. Now, let's get started, shall we? This is the first thing you'll need. Please be careful not to hurt yourself on the sharp edges. Ow. Is this supposed to be a comedy sketch or some weird performance art? I honestly can't tell. After that's over, we thankfully only cut back to the Wookiees for about a second and a half before we go right into the next sketch. The Wookiees TV suddenly starts showing some sort of documentary called Life on Tatooine, which the announcer says is required viewing for all Imperial forces. So they all immediately stop what they're doing and gather around the TV. Is this seriously more important than... well... Anything? Troopers, you heard the orders. Gather around the TV. But, sir, this house may have evidence that connects these people to the Rebellion. Nope, it'll have to wait. We gotta go watch the Discovery Channel. Sir, with all due respect, I'm afraid I must protest as this is a gross misuse of our resources. Well, I'll be sure to forward your formal protest to Lord Vader. Protest? What protest? I have no protest! I love these documentaries! I'm so glad Lord Vader allows us to watch these while on duty. That's what I thought, Private. That's what I thought.
Time now for Life on Tatooine, brought to viewers everywhere in the hope that our own lives may be uplifted by the comparison and enriched with the gratitude of relief. It's time to feel better about ourselves by making fun of poor people. Merry Christmas! We then cut to the Mos Eisley Cantina, where we find B. Arthur of all people tending bar. And look, Harvey Corman's back. Again. So first he was some weird alien chef, and then he was a malfunctioning android. What's he gonna do this time? <laughs> ah, of course, the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen. Mr. Corman is apparently infatuated with Miss Arthur, understandable, but does she feel the same way about him? If you're saying what I think you're saying, you felt you meant I thought you needed to hear, then I just have one thing to say I did not. Well, that's... Wait, what? Then another alert comes over the TV, and an Imperial officer announces a curfew on Tatooine. Because reasons. B immediately tries to convince her patrons to leave, but everyone's all like, Fuck the police! We're staying and we're drinking! These people. These are my people. B finally relents and offers everyone one more round on the house. This leads into a musical number loosely based on the Star Wars Cantina song. Good night, but not goodbye. And it's actually not half bad. Just one more round, friend. Then homeward bound, friend. Don't forget me in your dreams. Just one more song, friend. And then so long. Friend. The nights get shorter, it seems. This raises a very important question. Why couldn't the rest of the holiday special have been like this? I mean, it's not the greatest musical number ever, but it's miles ahead of all the crappy comedy sketches they've thrown at us. And with all the crazy looking aliens in the Cantina Band, it doesn't feel out of place in the Star Wars universe. And B. Arthur's performance is pretty damn good. I'm sure she knew she was in a terrible production, hell, everyone did, but that did not stop her from giving a damn. Hell, I wouldn't mind if the special was just two hours of B. Arthur's Cantina. Sadly, this is not to be, as we must return to those damn dirty Wookiees. Lumpy somehow uses his Commodore 64 knockoff to forge an Imperial signal ordering everyone to return to base. One of the stormtroopers stays behind to wait for Han and Chewie to arrive, and when they finally show up, they manage to kill the stormtrooper with his own stupidity. And so Chewbacca is reunited with his family, and they can finally celebrate Life Day by... putting on some red robes and holding lanterns and... crossing the sea to Valinor? I... I just, I don't know. I'm completely lost. I have no idea what's going on, and I think my brain just swallowed itself. Well, that's the end of the... wait. No. No, it's not the end. Of course it's not the end. Why would it be the end? If that was the end, we would never see the Wookiees gathering around the Tree of Life. What's the Tree of Life, you may ask? It's an overrated Terrence Malick movie, but that's not important right now. Wait. How did C-3PO and R2-D2 get there? How did Luke and Leia get there? How did Han get there? I thought he left. We celebrate a day of peace, a day of harmony. And of course, we gotta get one last musical number. It's terrible, but honestly, I don't really care at this point. Hell, considering how high she clearly is, I'm just amazed that Carrie is able to sing. Hell, I'm amazed she's able to stand. And so our story ends with Chewbacca and family enjoying their traditional Life Day feast. They all died of food poisoning three days later. The end. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Star Wars Holiday Special. I hardly know what to say. Calling this a train wreck feels like an insult to train wrecks. The story barely qualifies as a story, the jokes are not funny, the variety acts are lame, weird, or weirdly lame, the actors are mostly just going through the motions, especially the cast of the movie, and overall it's painfully boring and does no justice to the movie that inspired it. Sure, the cartoon was okay, B. Arthur's segment had its charm, and Jefferson Starship sounded alright, but that's not nearly enough to make the show worth watching. I can't even call it so bad it's good. 
It's just bad. I really don't want to recommend this to anyone unless you need a cure for insomnia, but if you really want to watch it, and don't say I didn't warn you, it's not terribly difficult to find it nowadays, despite George Lucas's best efforts. Lucas acquired the full rights to the special from CBS shortly after it aired in 1978 and has done his best to keep it out of the public eye. And for a while, he was successful. But thanks to the rise of the internet, many, many people have seen it at this point. Probably far more than when it was originally broadcast. And that's quite remarkable considering, as I said earlier, it has never been rebroadcast or released on home video. I assume Disney now owns the rights to the Star Wars Holiday Special, and believe it or not, I think they should release it on DVD. At this point, why not? It is an important part of Star Wars history, for better or worse, and you know people are gonna find a way to watch it anyway, so you might as well make a few bucks off it. Hell, at Star Wars Celebration this year, even Mark Hamill suggested they add the Holiday Special as a bonus feature the next time they release a box set of the movies. Everybody was embarrassed about it, but I said, look, it, it keeps us humble. It shows us that we're not infallible, that we stumble and make mistakes too, I mean. Well, I think The Phantom Menace already did that, Mark, but I see your point. But seriously, Disney, just release the damn thing already. You know you want to. You know we're all dumb enough to buy it. You might as well get it over with. The fans won't think any less of you. You gave them The Force Awakens, after all. I think they'll give you a pass. I'm not alone on this, am I? I don't know. Shia, what do you think? Just do it! Disney, the crazy man has spoken. Just do it. And that about wraps it up for the Star Wars Holiday Special. So until next time, have a safe and happy holiday season, and may the Force be with you. Wait, how the fuck did you get in here? Oh my god, what's wrong with your face?